The Spectrum Crunch. Just how bad is it for Verizon, AT&T, Sprint, and T-Mobile? And what's the U.S. government doing to fix it? In this 14th episode of Phone Wars, as we gear up to see the new Samsung and Apple phones, I wanted to go over the most precious piece of real estate the entire wireless network industry depends on. Wireless Spectrum. Before we get into it, I've linked some back-to-school Amazon shopping lists below. Whatever good deals you add to your cart, even if it's not on the list, actually support the channel. And thank you for all your support in past videos. We now return you to regular programming. But if you're wondering which U.S. carrier could have the best coverage and fastest data performance, this video was made for you. We are living in the age of mobile data. With our endless demand for apps, music, and video, we want the entire internet anytime, anywhere pushing up mobile data traffic by a factor of six over the next few years. While researching the first two Network Wars videos, something kept coming up. So much so that I wanted to devote a whole episode to this important foundation of mobile technology, an invisible infrastructure that growing parts of the U.S. economy depend on. Wireless Spectrum. This is a chart of all the UHF Spectrum companies use to build all kinds of wireless services. So many technologies are built on these electromagnetic waves. Besides cell phones, things like amateur radio, pagers, two-way radio, navigation for airplanes, military communication, satellite radio, and Wi-Fi take up space on our national wireless spectrum. And while many of these technologies are vitally important for other industries, it's the wireless carrier industry that's at the heart of billions of dollars in innovation. So in this episode, I hope to explain how certain bands of spectrum improve the coverage, performance, and download speeds of our mobile experiences today, as well as propel any next generation devices and appliances and even cars of the future. Why is spectrum important? Data speeds increase linearly with the amount of bandwidth or spectrum available. This means that data speeds and reliability will go down if we run out of spectrum. So I split up the episode in three parts. In part one, let's put things in perspective by looking at how a battle for spectrum affected a different multi-billion dollar industry over 80 years ago. In part two, let's see how the wireless carriers ended up where they are today. And in part three, we'll prognosticate over how the major carriers are planning on using their spectrum in the future. Part one. Some things never change. First, to set everything up, it helps to go over how the largest wireless information platform developed before the internet, that is, broadcast television stations. Although American startups had been experimenting with television broadcasting since the 1930s, the television industry really took off after the FCC stepped in to auction off broadcast television VHF spectrum during World War II. The first licenses established channels two through six. After the war, the FCC reserved some more spectrum for another new wireless technology, FM radio. So at the time, TV and FM radio were the next generation media platforms. But FM radio was overshadowed by the innovations happening with the TV. The TV industry demanded more spectrum capacity, so the FCC obliged and auctioned channels 7 through 13. But still, that wasn't enough. As the supply for stations exploded, Interference from overcrowding became a household problem. Adjusting the rabbit ear antennas to improve reception became a new family chore. To make matters worse, TV was about to transition from black and white to color. So the television industry needed more bandwidth, leading to the first major spectrum crunch. The television networks that got in early reserving low frequency spectrum on channels 2 through 6 didn't want things to change. More competition threatened their monopolies. Nevertheless, some entrepreneurs started building a UHF TV platform on available higher frequency spectrum. Unfortunately, the first UHF TV receivers and antennas were just really bad. The technical reception problems frustrated many early adopters who paid extra for a UHF-enabled TV. And it certainly didn't help that most of the large tech companies at the time were heavily invested in lower frequency VHF TV. But competition is usually good for consumers, so startups and the U.S. government kept trying to make higher frequency UHF TV a thing. But the laws of physics gave first movers in low frequency spectrum a technical advantage. The lower frequency VHF stations had better coverage, could penetrate buildings better, had better reception, and ultimately gave VHF stations more market share and industry support. Since broadcast TV was free to watch, the major stations made money from advertising like this early TV commercial. But advertisers always spend more money with the biggest audiences. Just check out the prices for Super Bowl commercials. By the 1950s, most of the local UHF stations couldn't build sustainable audiences and eventually went bankrupt. At the same time, the early network stations with the best low-frequency bandwidth grew bigger and bigger. And when TV manufacturers stopped including UHF antennas in new TVs, 
UHF stations were practically done. Things were looking so bad that Congress passed a law requiring all new TVs to include UHF antennas helping boost competition. This legislation gave these weaker stations the audiences they needed to build their networks. But it wasn't until cable and satellite companies figured out how to bypass the spectrum crunch that these UHF stations finally hit the jackpot. So why did you just watch a history of broadcast TV? There's a point, I promise. The same fights over spectrum that gave birth to the golden age of TV are happening today in the mobile wireless industry. Instead of TV networks fighting for money from advertisers, today wireless carriers are fighting for money directly from subscribers. And as subscribers, we should want two things. Great wireless service and reception, and awesome devices. So besides spectrum, Wireless carriers need support from smartphone vendors. They need smartphones with compatible antennas that work on their parts of the wireless spectrum. These specific parts of wireless spectrum are called bands. Here's a chart of UHF spectrum frequency before the smartphone revolution during the age of 2G. Data speeds were slow because the technology wasn't there yet and the amount of available spectrum was limited. But things started to fall into place about five years ago when analog TV went digital. You see, digital broadcast TV is more efficient, packing more channels into less spectrum. This freed up a lot of spectrum that used to carry analog TV broadcasts. Personally, I remember selling hundreds of digital set-top boxes to people getting their analog TVs ready for digital broadcasts. But the real value in wireless spectrum wasn't digital TV. Millions of people today just use cable or satellite. All the big bucks went to the cellular industry during the transition from 3G to 4G LTE. First, let's briefly cover 3G. 3G is still an important part of wireless service today. Verizon Wireless delivers 3G technology through a CDMA technology known as Enhanced Voice Data Optimized, or EVDO, on these formerly popular spectrum bands. AT&T's 3G network relies on a GSM technology called High Speed Data Packet Access, or HSD. PA. Sprint's 3G network uses the same technology as Verizon and Metro PCS. The Nextel acquisition gave Sprint the largest total service revenue at the time, but it also cost a lot of money. Sprint had to stop investing in its EVDO network in 2007, but its AMPS and PCS Spectrum bands had broad support from smartphone vendors at the time. Lastly, like the UHF TV stations during the last century, T-Mobile had to catch up to the big carriers who were there first. So they bought a new nationwide band of higher frequency spectrum called Advanced Wireless Services, or AWS which would turn out to be a prescient move, which I'll talk about later. So most flagship smartphones sold today must support these legacy 3G networks with antennas tailored to these specific spectrum bands. This is why a GSM phone that works on AT&T's network will also work on T-Mobile, or a CDMA phone works on both Verizon and Sprint's 3G network. And today, a lot of voice calls are still using older technologies, which explains why voice call quality is still pretty bad. But it turns out, the big money is in the fourth generation of GSM technology that introduced broadband speeds to wireless networks, LTE. This transition serendipitously coincided with a bunch of low-frequency spectrum left over from the analog-to-digital TV transition, and the U.S. was one of the first major countries to upgrade to LTE. As soon as the FCC announced the auction for this leftover UHF spectrum, Verizon, AT&T, and Google stepped up to the plate to bid on this prime piece of spectrum real estate. Check out episode 2 of Network Wars to find out how Google influenced the outcome. This auction of 700 MHz spectrum was massive. The carriers that licensed this spectrum would have the lowest frequency, best quality spectrum in the world. Just like with VHF TV during World War II, the lower the frequency, the better the coverage. These radio waves travel farther with less signal degradation. So all things being equal, the 700 MHz band of frequency offered better coverage going through foliage and walls more efficiently than the higher frequency spectrum T-Mobile bought in 2006. And it was perfect for covering a large open country like the United States. Carrier networks built on lower frequencies wouldn't need as many cell sites because the signal could travel farther. But there is a huge downside. LTE antennas designed to work on the 700 MHz bands in the U.S. do not work on international LTE networks where the higher frequency AWS bands are more popular. So many U.S. phones were locked into U.S. carrier networks by design. In the end, Verizon came out on top with a huge nationwide slice of spectrum. AT&T came in second with bits and pieces scattered around the country. Sprint didn't need the 700 MHz because it was busy supporting the Nextel spectrum at the time. And T-Mobile was still building its 3G network on the higher frequency AWS spectrum it bought two years before. But for T-Mobile, 
higher frequency spectrum does have some advantages. The size of the cell site base stations can be smaller, which is better for dense urban areas where real estate is at a premium. Also, higher frequencies can handle more capacity, allowing Sprint and T-Mobile to continue offering unlimited data. And the coverage advantage of lower frequency spectrum goes away in crowded places like Manhattan and downtown San Francisco, where steel skyscrapers wreak havoc on these lower frequency radio signals. In dense areas, a 700 MHz network needs just as many cell sites as a high-frequency 2.5 GHz network. So if I could boil down wireless spectrum down to two big points, it would be 1. Low-frequency spectrum is better for suburban and rural areas where the land is flat and there isn't as much network congestion. In these places, Verizon and AT&T have the advantage. And 2. High-frequency spectrum is better for dense urban areas where skyscrapers get in the way and millions of devices are clogging up the network simultaneously. Sprint and T-Mobile might have the advantage here. Part 3. Are the wireless carriers running out of spectrum? Is there really a spectrum crunch? When the FCC auctioned off the 700 MHz spectrum that underpins the US smartphone revolution, most industry observers failed to predict how valuable this piece of wireless spectrum would actually be. But Verizon and AT&T did not make that same mistake. Verizon immediately started building what would become the largest 4G LTE network in the world, hitting full coverage in the second quarter of 2013. And even though its LTE network has great coverage, Verizon still struggles in dense urban cities. So the company recently bought even more spectrum. These cable companies were squatting on 20 MHz of high-frequency popular AWS spectrum, the same frequency used by T-Mobile and used in other countries. So Verizon is building out 70% more LTE capacity in congested areas using small cell sites on AWS bands. But Verizon's big hit next year will be the introduction of nationwide voice over LTE. Subscribers will get HD voice and upgraded chat functionality that combines texting, video sharing, file transfers, and geolocation exchange, all in the texting app. So far, these phones have the supported LTE radios to enable voice over LTE. I'll try to add these details in future Phone Awards videos as new devices come out. And Verizon is expecting to make a truckload of money. Right now, they're gearing up for the second largest acquisition in corporate history to buy out Vodafone's stake in the company. Basically, Verizon wants all the profits to itself. Meanwhile, AT&T has also been on a spectrum buying spree to support the next step in its LTE networks something called LTE Advanced. It bought 12 MHz of 700 MHz frequency from Qualcomm and plans to introduce this new network next year. But what is LTE Advanced? LTEA will double capacity and improve performance through something called carrier aggregation. Current LTE networks operate in a narrow, often contiguous band of spectrum. This can cause reception problems like dropped calls or interference. LTE Advanced patches together disparate pieces of spectrum and minimizes interference problems that happen when uplink and downlink spectrum are too close together. Unfortunately, LTE Advanced won't be evenly distributed nationwide, and you need a device with a Category 4 LTE chipset like the Snapdragon 800 processor. In the meantime, AT&T has been filling the gaps by buying high-frequency and low-frequency spectrum from companies like Nextwave, Atlantic Telenetwork, and even Verizon. Sprint. Struggling under the weight of its huge Nextel and Clearwire investments, Sprint got a second life with the SoftBank acquisition this year. June 29th, 2013 was the end of Nextel and its push-to-talk network, and the beginning of Sprint's LTE future. Sprint will begin to deploy 3G and LTE on Nextel's 800 MHz spectrum. This lower frequency will boost Sprint LTE reception inside buildings and cities, just like it does for AT&T and Verizon today. But check with Sprint before buying a new device to make sure the antenna can receive these 800 MHz LTE frequencies when they're actually activated. T-Mobile will get a huge boost from its Metro PCS acquisition. After it combines the LTE networks and refarms Metro's older CDMA network, T-Mobile will have an astounding 40 MHz of coverage in these cities. Recently, T-Mobile bought more high-frequency AWS spectrum, and Verizon swapped spectrum, giving T-Mobile a healthy 20 MHz of AWS to cover 60 million more people with LTE. T-Mobile is in the lead with LTE on its higher-frequency AWS spectrum, which has become the global standard for LTE networks in other countries. And remember, higher-frequency spectrum is great for dense urban cities where network capacity is a problem. So is there a spectrum crunch? While the four big carriers are acting like Spectrum is running out, they're spending billions of dollars to make sure they have enough to keep their subscribers happy. Because as smartphones become more critical to modern life, they know people will switch carriers in a heartbeat if it means getting better service. 
But that's not all. The US government is getting involved again. It turns out digital TV isn't as big as people expected it to be. The FCC is trying to get digital TV broadcasters to auction off a bunch of their leftover 600 megahertz spectrum in an upcoming reverse auction scheduled for next year 2014. I'm sure the carriers with the biggest bank accounts will be ready to whip out their checkbooks when the time comes. So in conclusion, the fight for supremacy in mobile broadband is fascinating. The wireless industry knows what's at stake, investing billions of dollars as if it were monopoly money. But mobile broadband is no board game. Ultimately, trillions of dollars of future economic value and innovation are at stake, and no one can afford to be left behind. If you'd like to support the channel and order your next smartphone, check the Amazon links below to make sure you're getting the best deal. And now's the traditional time where I personally thank all the most recent subscribers. Welcome to this channel, a small corner on the internet where we can share ideas and opinions about innovative things that might one day qualify to be our next digital appliances. I always read every single comment, and thanks in advance for liking and sharing these videos on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, and Reddit. They definitely take tons of work and research, but as always, your comments keep me motivated and help me plan out future episodes. As always, if you really liked this video, click the squares from your computer or check the links below to watch related episodes, especially as I go over the latest smartphones coming out over the next couple of weeks. And thank you all for supporting the channel as I continue to share new and innovative products and services here on 